Get ready to move the conversation forward. This ain't your granddad's news and comment show. This is I Doubt It Podcast with Brittany Page and Jesse Dallimore. Welcome to the show, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Episode 800, I have to look at my notes, 856 of I Doubt It Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Dollimore, joined today by the lovely, the talented, and the scholarly Brittany Page, but also the lovely, talented, and scholarly Ryan Bell. <laughs> How's it going? Thanks for joining us, Ryan. Pleasure. Again. Yeah. Many times. I think this is five, four. Well, I looked it up, and it was a little confusing because we, we haven't been super great about, I guess, our naming convention for the episodes, so it was unclear. Like, sometimes I think we just put your name in the title, like, because we were talking about you, and you it was weren't like, actually- It was a flex. It was trying to get we more listeners. got list- Ryan Bell on the show. You were trying to get more listeners, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I think the first time you were on the show, and tell me if this seems right with, like, what we're going to be talking about with your Year Without God- the January 9th, 2014, on our 36th episode. Was that, I on that early? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Before I met you in Orange County, we were on your. I was on your podcast? I think we had just met. Oh, wow. Yeah, that must have been early that year. Wow, that's super early. It was, I mean, we, our first show was March 11th, 2014. So this was... Yeah, July just a few months later. Okay. And then you came on again September 6th, 2015. That's episode 154. This is for the people that want to go back and yeah. see what you were saying at this time all those years ago. And then a bonus episode June 4th, 2018 as well. So I have three. I don't know if it was more than that. No. But people are probably wondering who who is Ryan Bell? Why are you guys having him on? Aside from the fact you've been here multiple times. But you did the Year Without God. Do you want to explain what that was for people? Yeah, it's been a long time since I've explained it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, let's see if I can dust off that story. Um, I was a pastor for 20 years um, in the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, raised more or less in that denomination. And after about 20 years of sort of struggling with my own sort of political and theological growth, I had come to an impasse and I think the denomination agreed that I had come to an impasse and was um, asked or required or forced to leave the church. <clears throat> so I, um, so I did that. I, you know, were they nice about it? Like how, how was it? Was it very kind of technical and clinical and, and professional or, or what was it? Yeah, it was, it, it was nice. I mean, it was sort of like, um, you know, earnest, you know, really pleading with me to come around and and um, be faithful to my vows, mm -hmm. um, my ordination vows. And I, but I think the church sort of assumes that you're sort of frozen in time, you know, that you're not going to think or grow or learn much, even though they do s tend to send, you know, younger pastors to seminary, to graduate school, to learn more about the Bible, theology, original languages, all of that. Um, so yeah, it was a pleading, but it was, it was also like, almost like a foregone conclusion that I was beyond where they could get me back. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. I was basically asking them to leave me alone because they liked some of the results that I was producing in the church. Um, younger people were coming back to church. People that would probably never have joined any other Adventist church were coming to church because we were focused on, um, things in the community. We were focused on, you know, joining the struggle to end homelessness in our community. We were working on a community garden where we were inviting the neighbors to come and grow food and a place that used to have a parking lot, you know? And so it was kind of like, sort of like the reverse of that Amy Grant song, I guess, you know, we were taking up the parking lot and putting back, you know, live growing things. And so that was the kind of like very tangible feet on the ground kind mm -hmm. of work that we were doing instead of this kind of, um, you know, abstract theoretical, like God loves you and you need to go to heaven when you die. And, to do that, you have to check these boxes. We weren't really focusing on that, um, which really irritated the, the denomination. Because right. for them, it's about people joining the church. And, of course, when they join the church, they're encouraged to give money to the church. Right, right. Which is how the whole thing keeps going. Yeah. So, for 20 years, you are just about 20 years, you were a pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist 
flavor of Christianity. Yeah. You came to a moment where you didn't believe anymore. You then you made a media splash because you tried on a quote unquote tried on atheism for a year. Right. You were gonna do that. And that's where Year Without God came. came from. Yeah. So I was nine months between the time I left the church and when I started Year Without God, um, which was a really lonely nine months. In fact, it's 10 years ago, less than a week from now will be 10 years since I had my last sermon, my last day in church. Um, I've attended church since then um, for various reasons. In the early days, it was to see if I still wanted to go to church, even though I wasn't a pastor anymore. Did I want to just become a parishioner now, you know, mm -hmm. in a different denomination or a different flavor of church. Um, but then after nine months of trying to figure out what to do next, um, I had a few choices, but went with this blog, which I thought wouldn't be a full-time gig, right? I mean, writing a blog is not tip typically <laughs> right. a full-time job. Um, and I wrote an, that opening post in January 1st. I think it was like the 31st of December. Um, um, as we were going from 2013 into 2014 on the Huffington Post, and I just called it a year without God. Hmm. And then I know, I know because we, you know, now we're friends, and you were, it was like a, a splash. You were like, the, there was a, I don't even want to call it 15 minutes of fame, but you like, you were on with Brooke Baldwin on CNN. You did a, an international media tour where people wanted to know what the hell is this? How do you, yeah, how do you go from being a pastor for 20 years to being an atheist? And as part of your, year without God, it was some of the, like you set parameters for yourself. You weren't going to pray and mm -hmm. do the things that, that are required or common for Christians. Right. And after the year, it's, it's stuck, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I was, I definitely announced after the one year, cause I had committed to a year. So I announced after a year that I was an atheist, that I didn't believe in God anymore, that I was um, also a humanist, which we can talk about if you want later. But, um, so, yeah, I, but I think I was most of the way there before the year was up, but I had committed a year. People were like, come on, you're an atheist. Why don't you just call it and, like it was like July or something like that? And I was like, no, I'm going to I'm going to give it the year, you know, and about halfway through the year when I felt like I had convinced myself or was satisfied that there was very likely no God. I went back and started reading some books by. Christian apologists, I tried to like find the best ones, the least snarky, the least asshole kind of ones, yeah. <laughs> which is kind of a tricky thing to do sure. to find those, you know, most of them are like, ha ha, you know, trying to score points and, and not, not to both sides it or what it, it but same thing exists on the other side with it. Oh, that's what I find in the atheist community yeah. is a lot of dickish snark yep. and yep. like wearing just shitty disrespectful t-shirts to somebody's close you know closely held religious beliefs right well did you ever go through a period like that i mean because i think sometimes that is born out of anger or frustration or sometimes even mourning the loss of your faith and then you get kind of angry about maybe the time you spent dedicating your life to this thing that you no longer believe to be true yeah did yeah. you go through a period where you were angry and and maybe lashing out at believers or mocking them i think I probably did. Um, there were some definite moments on like a Facebook post or a tweet where I would be a little um, sharp elbowed about it. And, you know, the person I was dating at the time was a, still a Christian and she would be like, to she was totally supportive of my experiment, whatever you want to call it, my journey. Mm -hmm. I hate that word. Uh, <laughs> I got to throw up in my mouth a little bit every time I say it. But Why I'm do like you hate science? <laughs> <laughs> so she, you know, she would say sometimes like, hey, that wasn't fair. You know, and I'm like, yeah, okay. Not all Christians, right? Not all yeah, Christians. Yeah, yeah. So, but it, you know, I found, and I still find actually to this very day that it depends on who I'm talking to. Mm. So if I'm talking to one of those, you know, arrogant atheists, I tend to be a little bit more like, hey, you know, like that's not how Christians read the Bible. Like you're reading the Bible in this very wooden, like stiff, like, literal way and there are christians who read the bible that way but the lion's share of christians you know have a sort of a more nuanced reading and we can make of that nuanced reading whatever we want but it's not fair to say all christians think that you should stone someone for disobeying their parents because right. it says so in the old testament they have a theology about how we don't do that anymore and you can argue about that theology all you want but christians don't generally believe that you should stone your children yeah you know it's like so it's not fair to be like oh yeah christians think believe in stoning children like come on 
but then also if I'm talking to a Christian and they're, you know, sort of making all these broad assumptions about where we all stand, you know, like we all believe whatever, and it makes me irritated that I have to sort of, in order to honor something in my community, I have to attend a prayer vigil. Like, why does it have to be a prayer vigil for me to pay respects to this homeless person who died or something like that right, sure. in my community? I don't want to go to a prayer vigil. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to go to a, an event that's welcoming to everyone to honor this person who's passed away. So I find myself getting irritated kind of both directions. Yeah. Do you feel over the, you know, with this 10 year anniversary coming up, do you feel like you look at the 10 years in stages at all? Like you can recognize the beginning part of the 10 years, you were maybe feeling a certain way. And mm. then midway through the 10 years, things started to shift for you in terms of your focus or beliefs. That's a great question. I haven't thought about it that way. I'm trying to lay the groundwork for like your upcoming blog on this issue. <laughs> I'm trying to help you. Let's get the ideas. No, no, no. I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the first, you know, people ask about, like, as you recently did, about um, whether I was angry. And I think the thing I was most angry about in those early, that first stage was probably characterized by a lot of just real frustration. And it really came from not a lack of God, but a lack of money. Mm. Um, because it was my career, my job to do this. And I had a, a fairly generous severance that lasted me a couple of like maybe three months. Um, and then I needed to find a job. And then, so then here I was in my mid forties, you know, applying for entry level positions that paid, you know, 10 to $15,000 less per year than the median income in my community. Yeah. And not, and then supporting my ex-wife by the then ex-wife and children and also in, in need of my own apartment you know, it was a huge stretch. And um, I spent a lot of my uh, retirement savings, which incurs an IRS penalty. So sure. I'm still in debt 10 years later for the transition that I made, um, trying to pay off some old debts. And I'm making progress on it. But I, I say that not to be like, poor me, but just to say like, that was really upsetting, you know? And it was more of an ups anger with myself for not having a better backup plan. Like I really intended to be a pastor for the rest of my life and then maybe yeah. then maybe be an author and a speaker as I slowed down in my later years but um I was like back at the beginning yeah well you don't have that thought on the radar of uh am I gonna lose my faith in God am right. I, am I gonna be an atheist yeah. <laughs> yeah there is no way to plan for that I mean you are to to contemplate that that what ended up being eventuality uh, eventuality is to question your, you're questioning your faith before you're questioning, it's like a preemptive right. doubt. And you're, that's, you don't leave space for that. Yeah, you don't know what you don't know. And so you, you encounter that kind of as a surprise as things go along. And I had sort of like pieced it together for a lot of years where I started losing bits of my faith. So I would like, I didn't really believe in a literal heaven um, mm. at one point in my pastoral career. Um, I thought it was a distraction that people were focused on going to this other place and really abandoning the place. And there's actually a sort of a planned abandonment of the earth, you know, and all that that entails on the part of conservative, you know, evangelical Christians. Oh, yeah. They don't care about the environment. They don't care about poverty and suffering because we're going to get our due. It's a death cult. Yeah, it's kind of a death cult. So that was the first phase, I think, you know, to come back to your question. Um, the second was probably... Um, sort of sort of hitting my stride and being a part of the atheist secular community where I um, I even worked for the Secular Student Alliance for three years. Um, I felt like I had been in looking for a place to land that was sort of a almost an analog to being a pastor to being like a chaplain in that world, you know? So I thought, well, that's a smooth transition maybe. Um, to where I am now is like a, maybe a third phase if we want to do like a nice tidy three part. I, I'm seeing my blog post emerge now. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think this third part is where I don't really think about it at all anymore. You know, I, it just occurred to me as we, um, I forget what made me think of it, but you know, as 2023 dawned, I think I started, oh, I know probably it was um, Facebook started throwing up like 10 year anniversary posts. And I oh, was right. like, holy shit, that's, that this is 10 years since I stopped going to church, since I stopped being a pastor. So I'm sort of now for the first time in a while thinking about it again and um, thinking about what I want to say and really happy that I never finished that book that I was working on shortly after I left um, because I would probably really not like it. 
well, what what's different now? I mean, I know, and in, in, in I'll speak for myself, in my personal journey out of faith and the, the God question used to be so compelling to me and interesting. And I used to th- say that like politics that affect our daily lives and religion those are like the two, you know, the, the two things you're not supposed to talk about in a bar. Right. No politics, no religion. To me, they were the most fascinating. And now the God question is just uninteresting to me, not important, because real lives hang in the balance of political questions and policy questions. And what has there been kind of a shift for you away from the quote unquote atheism, you know, that movement to. Mm-hmm. To something more impactful of people. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think atheism per se is a very um, prescribed question. It's a very like bounded question. It's a question of whether a person believes that God exists or not. So if you don't believe that God exists, then you're an atheist, whether you like the word or not. If you do believe that God exists, you're a theist. And it's kind of a binary thing. And once you kind of come to a satisfactory um assessment of that question for oneself, then then it's kind of over, right? There's not much else to talk about. And then there's like a host of implications. If you don't believe in God, then what else about, you know, what happens when we die are sort of existential questions and then how we ought to treat other people and all of those things kind of emerge from that. But the actual debate and this sort of apologetic debate on both sides about whether God exists or... Um, the evidence for or against and all of that. It's just something I I wasn't interested in it very much as a pastor and I'm not I was not really that interested in it. After spending a year looking at it, I was pretty much done with that. And I've moved you know, moved on or maybe continued on is a better way to say mm. uh, with the things that I was interested in really all of my adult life. Um I would say since 9/11, I was saying to Brooke the other day, my wife that um I I feel like I woke up and after 9-11 like I was trying to think of what I cared about before 9-11 and I couldn't come up with anything really Hmm. like I didn't have you know I was married so I cared about my wife I didn't have children Um, I wasn't really involved in social justice I wouldn't have even been able to tell you what that meant I didn't really I wasn't super patriotic but I wasn't super not patriotic I mean I just I wasn't very political yeah yeah I was like, what was I doing? What did I think about? <laughs> and that was just a jolt. Yeah, it really was a, a huge jolt um, in part. And I've said before in other places that immediately around my community, I started to see these movable lettering signs at bars, not just churches, but bars, restaurants, you know, VFW halls, wherever, saying, God bless America. Mm-hmm. And I m- remembered hearing on the news about the bombers or the per- airplane pilots that they were doing this as a result of their conviction in some kind of religious belief or that God had inspired them to do this. And whether that's exactly the way to analyze those attacks or not, on the, on the face of it, that's what they were saying and that's what we were saying and George Bush, George W. Bush made a real point of the war and, and sort of the response to 9-11 being very religious in, in tone. And I was like, well, we can't both be right. Like, it can't be that God's on our side and that God's on their side. And it really threw me into an interfaith conversation um, because there's a lot of exclusive claims. Christianity has exclusive claims. Islam has exclusive claims. Some religions have less of that. Sure. Um, So that really woke me up to uh, the complexity of the world. You know, I think when people talk about the original, you know, I don't know if we want to get into this, but the original people who coined the expression woke it literally meant to wake up to the broader understanding of what's going on in the world, to be aware, to, right. be, to be awake, to wake up from a sleep where you're sleeping in your privilege and just really content with life because it's all working for you. Um, and in my case, as a you know middle class white man with a family and a house and all of that, to the reality that not everyone was as comfortable or as um, safe and so that that really started me on that journey of really seeing my faith as a way of entering that question around justice and fairness and um, and goodness, ethics. And I think it that progressed as time went along. And then I discovered that the church was actually like fanning that flame of inequality and injustice. And that made me mad. And so from the inside of that organization, the church, broadly speaking, I was trying to make a difference in sort of rectifying those things or creating a space where people that felt harmed 
by all of this could find refuge and be together and think about a better world. So what I'm hearing is that maybe you should have started a blog after 9-11 that preceded Year Without God that was just Year Without Year with less God. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, I did start a blog not too long after that called Intersections, and it was just an exploration of all the things I was doing as a pastor and kind of interesting observations I was making. Hmm. But So once you leave the God question behind, because that is settled, uh, it, it sounds like it becomes more about making meaning. How do you make progress on these issues of justice and fairness, but also... How are you going to make meaning in your life if it's not coming from spirituality, God, church, those things? Is mm -hmm. that kind of what the journey, <laughs> to use the word you hate, uh, became? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I don't know that I've very often thought of it like, explicitly as like making meaning, like I'm going to make meaning today. But I think that's what it comes down to. Um, and there is that moment that I think every sort of non-believer who was once a believer has to deal with. Um, and I think the biggest loss for me in, in losing my faith or sort of discovering that it didn't fit me anymore was that in Christianity, there is kind of this, um, well, King, Martin Luther King, quoting somebody else whose name I always forget, talked about the arc of the universe bending towards justice. Yeah. And and it's... Um, you know, the, the Christian sort of theological subset of talking about the future and the end of time and all that eschatology is kind of like about where history is moving. And in Christianity, there is a goal to history. Like things are moving towards a conclusion right. that, that God has control over and that God will work it out, right? That we can't see that conclusion perfectly. It looks like chaos to us, but from that God's eye view, things are going to resolve. And it's Isaiah 55, 8, and 9, that, that just as high as the heavens are above the earth, God's thoughts are that much higher than our thoughts. That's right. Don't question it. You, look, we can't understand it. We're, we're lowly humans. Leave it to God. Yeah. It's in his hands. But I think the result of that on the individual level is that when I was a Christian, when I couldn't me figure out what something meant, you know, and that was the, you know, this is one thing I was thinking about recently too, that as a pastor, it was my job to make meaning out of meaningless events in the world. So when I stood up in the pulpit on the weekend and there had been a terrible shooting or a, you know, an earthquake that had struck Haiti or the flood that's, that overwhelmed New Orleans. It had to serve a purpose. Right. And I that had purpose to, had to be religious. I had to fit it in somehow. Like, this is what it all means. Good you luck. Know? Well, good, right. Because at the very <laughs> least, at the very least, God allowed that right. to happen. So it is part of the plan because it was allowed to happen. Right. Yeah, and it's exhaust. I, I just found it, I think, I didn't think of it as exhausting, but when I quit, I realized how exhausted I was of trying to make like a square peg fit in a round hole, like all the time. And so I think that sense of, of meaning or of like when everything looks like chaos, I could at least go to bed at night and think, well, God's in control. You know, mm -hmm. somehow this is going to work out. Now when I go to bed at night, I think this probably isn't going to work out, right? <laughs> like we probably are not going to solve the climate crisis. Probably a lot of people are going to die as a result of our inaction. Um, probably there's going to be a lot more mass shootings, you know, because we seem to be incapable of putting any kind of safeguards around our families and children and so forth. So, so you go to bed in a real good mood. In a, good, in a great mood. That's great. Well, someone hearing that is going to think, dear God, I don't want to lose my faith. <laughs> I need to hang on to that for dear life. Yeah. So what is it in the context of knowing that, like knowing that bad things happen, knowing that bad things are going to continue to happen, what is it that still gets you out of bed every morning? I think the, ch the chance to make a difference, the chance to do something um, that contributes to that, me being wrong about that, that, that maybe we do solve the climate crisis. Maybe we do in the nick of time, you know, decide collectively that we want to save our lives. So well, God isn't in control, but we are we in are, control. Yeah, we're in control. We have the choice to do that. I think that's really the heart of humanism. I mean, if you look at all the varying definitions of humanism, they all say some version of, um, without respect to gods, we as humans have agency and that we are responsible. And, you know, you start getting into moral territory, um, but we're responsible to um, care for one another. Yeah. And not just one another, but also the environment 
in which we live where you know like your beautiful dog is not a human but we have a responsibility to care for pets and and other animals and the things that we require to live like water and air and all the rest so but it takes intentionality behind it it's not i mean cynicism i think there's no value in cynicism to me and i don't think you're i know you well so i don't think you're cynic but right. but i think a lot of people they do like there's nothing I can do about climate change. There's nothing I can do about the suffering in the world. It is tempting because the biggest problems that we face are at this massive scale, and it's really hard to think about. But without people having intention to do good, it is just going to go to fucking shit. It's it is. just going to, we're going to burn. The, the yeah. earth is going gonna, is gonna to fry and we're all going to die unless people step up and adopt some intentionality in their lives to, to make a difference, to, to make that change. Yeah, I, it, to me it comes down to organizing, you know? Yeah. And I think being a pastor was a kind of organizing. I didn't think of it in those terms. But what's great about a congregation is that they meet together once a week, they have a common goal, whether we agree with that goal or not, and they can act together, mm -hmm. you know, on shared values and shared objectives. And I think you know, what the atheist community and the secular community has had to struggle with is that there isn't that common objective that kind of brings people together in this organized way. So I've, you know, I've traded um, my religious life for a life of organizing, basically, where I realized that, and we talked about this the other day, of, you know, that my recycling of my cans and bottles and such is not going to make a hill of beans difference in the future of our climate. Um, I still think I should do that because why the hell not? Of course, you right? Should. Like, yeah, why? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm not just gonna. Well, like, let's not get the audience off track. That I'm like, why are you recycling, Ryan? What a fucking rube! <laughs> no, no, that's no, not that's not what you're saying. And I don't mean to like, yeah, I don't mean to like, uh, you know. No, I'm just, you don't need to explain. Right? Yeah, it was but, a conversation about policy that we need from a governmental standpoint. That's the, right. The government to put in place a policy that requires everyone to do it. So right. it's not up to you and me and Brittany to be you know, the three people who are recycling. I mean, that's a, a perfect example of that is in California, you know, like everywhere, we had these thin plastic grocery bags that we would, right. every time, and we would, every trip to the store, you would get like 10 or 12 or something. And they're you know? double bagging them. It's yeah, and then they don't recycle, and they just go in the landfill, and they last fucking forever. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so we were like, hey, you should use these reusable bags. And people, conscientious people did, and then it kind of caught on, but it, not enough until California, state of California finally said, fuck it, we're not using these bags anymore. Nobody gets these bags. Yeah, that's right. And everybody sort of went like, okay. Well, it was a referendum. <laughs> it was on the ballot. We, we were still in California. We voted for that. And we all agreed that this was something that we should do, and it wasn't that big of a hardship, right. and it makes a huge difference on yeah. a scale like that. You and me not using plastic bags, right? it's important, but it's not gonna make that big of a difference. On a California-wide scale, fourth largest economy in the in the world, yeah, yeah. that's a big deal. That's a huge contribution to not putting plastic in the, in the ground. Right. Yeah. Which really does, uh, just point to and identify the the importance of organizing because that movement started yep. for that referendum that was on the ballot. It started with a few passionate people who lived with intentionality, who wanted to make a difference, right. and then they impacted the world because of it. If, Let me if put they it, had just gone to sleep like, oh, fuck, there's school shootings. All right, well, I'm not going to wake up. I'm just going to be... Nothing would have gotten done. That's and right. Not, that's not you. I know that's, that's right. not you. You're you're a guy who gets shit done. <laughs> yeah. You know, so... To put an even finer point on it, that referendum or any referendum happens because those very people who got that referendum on the ballot first started by trying to get their elected officials to ban it right. or do something about it and failed because they were like, well, but what about the plastic industry? How am I gonna get my campaign donations? Uh, and yeah. then, so they were like, oh, I'm so frustrated with these people, this democratic supermajority in California who won't do the most elementary things to save you know, the planet. Not to say they're not doing anything good, they're doing a lot of good things. But then they were like, well, let's us take it into our own hands, let's put it on the ballot. Yeah. Which you, California, for those who don't know, have a has a very unique. I mean, it's it, there's a few other states that have it, but it, it's not the overwhelming majority of states that have the ability to have a referendum just put on the ballot, where in a true democratic fashion, yep. everybody gets a vote on yes or no on whatever measure it is. Yeah, and you have to collect you know a massive amount of signatures, so there's sure. also a democratic buy-in just to get it on the ballot. Yeah, you know, and then you have to win a majority. And this is your world now. You're 
you, you've you've kind of I don't want to say you've abandoned the God question or but it's less important to you and now what what is yeah important to you so I I work in tenant rights um, I work uh, for an organization called Tenants Together which is a statewide coalition of tenant groups around the state some of them are really strong and powerful and have staff others are small five or six tenants who have banded together to form an association in their building um, and again it's the same kind of thing you know. Again, I, and I want to preface this by, you know, saying the obligatory, not all landlords, you know, are horrible, you know, blood sucking. But there's enough <laughs> that are that it's a problem and there oh. needs to be tenant a advocacy groups. Right. Because the idea of, of owning rental property is that it's a business and you want to maximize your profit. Yeah. And like any profit making industry that affects people's core necessities, like whether it's food, shelter, health care, mm -hmm. those kinds of things are... Um, essential for human survival, let alone thriving. Yeah. And and so someone is extracting a profit from my absolute necessity to have a roof over my head. Mm -hmm. And so they're not, some, some landlords are compassionate, they understand that. And they're like, I won't raise the rent. And if I do, it'll be like 30 bucks a year so that over time I'm keeping up with inflation, but I'm not gonna out of nowhere raise someone's rent $500 or $200, which is, you know, I often remind people, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's every month, $200. That's like going out without any warning or any sort of premeditation and going out and buying like a Honda Civic. You know, most people can't just go buy a car, right? you know, without planning and saving and figuring out, okay, what are we going to cut? How are we going to make this work? And you get a, a thing in your mail that says... 30 days from now, your rent's going up 200 bucks. Well, also it's, you know, people, and I think everybody can understand that most vast majority of people can understand that we're already budgeted to, to, the, to, the, to the nth degree for everything. So if you just add on another thing that you didn't have any part in, any choice in, right. it can throw lives into the balance. Well, and you probably know better than me what the percentage is that people are spending on their housing. It's significant. It and is. It goes up, I think, on a regular basis. So we're yeah. already dedicating a significant amount of our monthly expenses to housing. Yeah. So HUD says the Housing and Urban Development Department and the federal government says that we should spend less than 30 percent of our income on housing, which includes rent and utilities. Mm. So when you add up your rent and utilities, just see, folks at home, like how much are you spending? Hopefully you're spending less than 30%. Sometimes in the national discourse, we've even gotten the idea that we should be spending 30%. It's like, no, the idea is you should spend less than that. If you can spend 20% right. on it, that's great because now you can spend more on your kids, more on your self-care, food, health. You know, Saving all, for retirement, which is- you Precisely, know, yeah. which is super precarious right. for all the reasons we were talking about a minute ago. Yeah. Um, and so if you're paying more than 30%, of your income for housing, we call that rent burdened. And if you're paying more than 50%, which many, many people are, that's severely rent burdened. And in some cities, there's upwards of half of the population that's spending more than 30%. In Pasadena, where I live, we've, we found when we did the research for our ballot measure that, that about a third of folks were spending more than half of their income on rent. Wow. And almost half of the population that rents was spending uh, over a third of their, over 30% of their income on rent. Um, and so a huge portion of Pasadena, which people, you know, folks listening to this show, when they think Pasadena, they're probably thinking the Rose Parade. That's, mm -hmm. when, that's when all yeah. the world tunes into Pasadena. Right, right, right. It's a beautiful city, lots of gorgeous architecture, world-class museums, a Philharmonic Orchestra, you know, all the- Major universities. Major universities, all the trappings of a world-class city. It's only 140,000 people, but it's a beautiful city that people aspire to live in. Mm -hmm. and, and yet you have this poverty essentially that's um because in every city there are people who you know iron folks clothes you know change the sheets at the hotel you know serve people's food clean people's houses push yeah. their kids stroller while they're at work you know all of those people also are living in the city for a for the economy to function and and so we were saying okay if, if those folks are essential to our lives and we're going to accept this relative inequality in our community at the very least folks should be able to afford their housing yeah, or stay in their housing, which yeah. is what rent control essentially does, um, which is the ballot measure that we fought for last November and won, which basically says rents can go up. We're not, a lot of people are like, oh, rent control, that means no rent, rents can't go up. How are landlords going to survive? The rent can go up. <laughs> yeah. It can go up according to the consumer price index, like everything else. Right. It's, it's pinned to yes. a certain metric. 
It's not at the whim of a landlord. You know, this is an issue we've been talking about during the, the entirety of the pandemic when, when the eviction moratorium was at the 11th hour pushed back or renewed multiple times because of irresponsibility on the part of, uh, obviously, of the Trump administration, but even the Biden administration, it continued. Yep. Um, and we've talked about the, the just the, the there's like some guy who's a who's a, a, a like a chief influencer within landlords who is like now we've got them there's nothing they can do we're just going to raise the rents where are they going to go where are they going to go yeah so having it pinned to a certain metric is beneficial well also for landlords that's right so it's it's not uh just a willy-nilly up to them whatever yeah and we you know we said during the pandemic too you know in, in california and in every state in the union there was this uh, federal bailout of landlords it's often framed as a bailout of tenants but it really was cash public money taxpayer dollars that went to landlords to shore up not just their expenses but their profits yeah so landlords had were made whole like i can't think of a single industry other than landlords during the pandemic and after that were made whole. You know, restaurants went out of business, yeah. clothing stores went out of business, even big corporate chains downsized and closed stores. And all they had to do was agree to keep people living in their, their space. That's right. Yeah, and not some, to put them on the street. That's right. They could get their all their rent repaid if they didn't evict them. And, and we, of course, know many cases where um, people were evicted anyway. Because and I won't go into the details of the eviction court process, which it really favors landlords. I mm -hmm. mean, if you don't answer your jury summons, you're not jury summons. If you don't answer your summons, which is the unlawful detainer that you get from the landlord when they sue you to leave, if you don't answer it in five days, there is a uh, default judgment against you in court, and you have to leave. Right. So all you could, all you'd have to do to get evicted, even with a moratorium in place, is to freeze up, get scared for five days, and be like, "Oh shit, I don't know what to do." I need a lawyer, but obviously I can't afford one. I can't even afford my fucking rent. Right. How am right. I going to yeah. afford a landlord? I mean, a <laughs> lawyer. A lawyer. Yeah. And um, well, they can't afford the landlord either. They can't afford the <laughs> landlord or the lawyer. And uh, and you kind of get scared for five days, which I have absolutely done. In fact, I went through a whole year of my life with piles of unopened mail. Yeah. I, listen, I'm the I'm the I'm the procrastinating. Uh, I'll just deal with that later. Because it's scary as yeah, fuck. You know, sure. you're like these are all people that want my money, and. I don't have any money, so I'm not going to open that. Yeah, <laughs> Especially in the midst of the pandemic when things were scary enough already. Yeah. yeah. But what we had in the pandemic was also then middle class tenants. And at the tenants union where I volunteer, we have a hotline and we started getting people calling in who are making, you know, their rent was three and four thousand a month. So we're not talking about like basic level rents. We're talking about people that make good livings. But in California, you know, you need like a quarter of a million dollars down payment to buy a house or something. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So... People that make good money working in the entertainment business, um, all of that, often are also renters, and they're renting houses, and they cost five, six thousand dollars a month to rent. Mm -hmm. And people that never, in the in their wildest dreams, thought of themselves as housing insecure, were suddenly housing insecure because the entertainment industry kind of stopped. We had photographers, cinematographers, sure. artists, set designers, all kinds of people who were calling our tenant hotline, being like, "My landlord wants me out." What do I do? Mm -hmm. You know, and so it became a much bigger issue. Unfortunately, in this country, once a problem affects the middle class, then people kind of sure. wake up and pay attention to yeah. it, which I'm not complaining because I, I think it's really important that we all see what a big problem this is. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's what a great journey, you know, for you, the, the pastor to year without God moving into more humanist pursuits like uh life after god which was the yeah, name of my podcast that's right life after god which great podcast by the way if you're out there and you haven't listened to it's still out there it's oh still, yeah yeah you can find it's on spreaker um just search for life after god um sadly i've had to ab abandon it for time purposes i think the website's even gone or something mm. like that i think it just i'm so ashamed it just sort of went away but if um if you look, look for it on spreaker you'll find it and there's a lot of i mean it was a lot of evergreen stuff sure. yeah you know, absolutely. they weren't it wasn't like your show where it's very like news centric and very timely um these were like authors of books and and concepts you know that are still really yeah really great so what now that you're 10 years removed from the year without god and life after god what Can't do you what do you what are you gonna do 
Um, you should, you know, like your the, the blog or writing or yeah, something to commemorate it. And yeah, I think you could motivate people to some intentionality, to some activism, to some organization. Yeah, definitely. I've definitely wanted. I've been thinking since the new year, or at least since I was aware that this ten year anniversary was coming, um, to to write something. So I'll, I, I'm planning to write um, a more lengthy reflection on the Substack that I have, which is. Uh, another thing that I've uh, sort of abandoned over the last few years. <laughs> well, you've been busy yeah. protecting the tenants. Yeah, yeah. you know, like uh, uh, amending the city charter in Pasadena. It takes a little time. <laughs> well, we'll put a link to that. Yeah, uh, I'm going to write that. We'll put a link to that in the show notes for sure. So this is the 10 year from when I left the church, and then there was nine months between before I started the year without God. So I'll probably have a few 10 year reflections coming along. Um, it's, it's interesting because I think the the perspective of time is really important. Um, I think if you know, it's my thoughts have changed a lot about it. Um, I don't think about it that often, so it takes a little time for me to like sure. think about what what has changed. What do I think? Um, I I still you know I still believe that religion is by and large a, a hindrance in people's sort of cognitive processes and their you know reasoning about the world. I I think it's. Um, it tends to be a crutch and something that limits people's motivation. On the other hand, there are a lot of, you know, progressive religious movements that use religion as a motivation to do things in the world. And as far as that goes, I think, awesome. Like, yeah. you know, just don't harm anyone. You know, it's, it's sort of like uh, the Hippocratic Oath, you know, just don't hurt anyone with your beliefs. That goes for atheists as well as, Absolutely. as Christians or Muslims or anybody else. Well, and I was going to say, when you were talking about those atheists that you do encounter that kind of motivate you to start defending religious people. I have felt that too, where there are people that get meaning from religion and don't use it to abuse other people. Don't, right. don't want to oppress other people. And if it gives their life meaning, if it motivates them to do good, if it gets them out of bed in the morning when they feel terrible, then do it. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I know some, you know, addicts that have recovered and and you know also escaped from homelessness and are securely housed today and you know they attribute a lot of it to their faith in god sure. they, they found Absolutely. god and it yeah. really gave them the motivation and i'm like hang on to that you yes. know why would anybody want to take that away yes. seriously because there was a positive result that came from it and at the end of the day it's not so different actually i think from me saying um you know, I'm really motivated to do all these things because I have my children and I think about them. I don't pray to them, but I think about them. I meditate on their well-being and mm -hmm. I, I think about my wife and what I want for her and what I want my legacy to be in the world. And and that's what motivates me. You know, it's, it's an abstract idea. Some abstract ideas that um, move me forward. And we all, I think, need whatever it takes. I mean, the older I get, the more I realize how fragile my mental health is, which I think I'm a fairly reasonable sample of a lot of people like me, sure. you know, in my position in life. And I think, yeah, we're with you. We don't think you're special either, right? Yeah, no, no, <laughs> definitely not special. <laughs> and I, so I'm like, our mental health is way more fragile than we think, mm -hmm. or at least than I thought when I was younger. And I think it is a function of age where you're just like, it wouldn't take very much to just push me over the edge, yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah. And I, people are talking about mental health versus housing as, you know, the thing that people need. And of course the conservative angle on homelessness that is that everybody's just insane and that's why they're on the street. Right. And I'm like, I think you have the causation reversed yeah. for the most part. Mm -hmm. I think if I were on the street for a week, I would be drinking more than I should. Oh yeah. Doing I, anything to do, get comfort. Ac ac exactly. Right. Yeah. I would be stealing things if I had to, I would be doing any number of illegal things, you yeah. know, to survive. Yeah. Um, and, and I think I would begin to lose my connection to reality, you know? It's, I think it, all of us. Yeah. So it's just, it's, I think it's just humbling to, to, to think about that and to realize that, that folks are fragile and that we can make a difference in people's lives um, and, um, and that collectively we can make a big difference. So that's, to me, I, I talk about humanism as being um, sort of a way of thinking about the world in which there are no promises. Christianity has all these promises that if you do this, this will happen. And when you wake up to the idea that there's no God, then all those promises kind of vanish. And that's a little scary at first. And so I think there is a fear factor in that. Um, but humanism, humanism to me is about learning to live without promises and being sort of um, 
the change, you know, to use a corny cliche, to be the change that we want to see in the yeah. world, um, to really step into that and to realize that it's not about me. It's really about the collective of us working together and really trying to build political coalition with folks to make, you know, positive change, whether that means, you know, volunteering at an agency in your neighborhood or, or organizing with tenants or running for office or whatever it is that you feel like compelled to do. I ran for office as well. Um, I, you know, that was a, a story for another day, but. <laughs> I think these are the thoughts that should be in your head before you fall asleep, rather than those other ones. Right. Like that whole monologue should just be, you should replay this when you go to bed right. at night. And I think for the most part, I don't think about, it's funny, we just got done watching The Last of Us, and um, my wife, I sort of drag her into shows like that, because it really sets her in a bad frame of mind, right? Because that could be a, a future. Yeah, right? sure, right. A future that we have, maybe not you know, aggressive mushrooms, but something else. Um, <laughs> aggressive to say the least. To say the least. <laughs> but um, but I kind of like those disaster shows in a way because it, it helps me see like the resiliency in people and what they'll do to survive and help. I mean, there's also the really negative side of it, right? Where people fight for the last scrap of food or whatever. But there's always in those shows the people who care for each other and help each other along. And, Humanity. Yeah, and I think it comes out in those shows what, you know, sets us apart from, you know, lions and tigers or whatever, you know, that are that are just about survival, that there is something in humans that make us want to uh, protect each other. And, and, um, and as you sign off from your show every week, you know, or every time, you know, take care of each other. Yeah. You know, I think that's really, I think you could summarize humanism in that way. You know, take care of each other. Yeah. No one's coming to save us. I mean, that's the the bottom line of of atheism is that we're it's just us. There's no rescue plan. There's no take two at the end. Nope. Yeah. So if we're yeah. gonna if we're gonna make this a, a life worth living, we have to do it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I th there's no better way, no better <laughs> place to end it than there. You want to drop the mic? That might be a better place to just take it off. Do not <laughs> drop the mic. <laughs> uh, where can people find you? Um, I'm on Twitter, Ryan J. Bell. That's probably one of the places I'm most uh, frequently found. Um, my Substack is ryanbell.substack. Okay. Um, Again, we'll put links to this in the show notes so people can find it. Yeah, and fair warning, there's not much new there for two years. Well, people who can lie in wait. Yeah, that's what right. What you're going to write now. Yeah, next to, to yeah, give me a subscribe on there. Um, I'm not, I don't, nobody pays to read my Substack, so don't feel any compulsion to do that. But, um, yeah, I plan to write some reflections in the next few months, um, days, and then months. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm super involved in local politics, so that part probably doesn't appeal to like a ton of people. But there are lessons to be learned from what happens in other people's local situations. Sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, if you have questions for Ryan, um, I'm sure we could get him on the phone. You happen to be here in Washington D.C. Uh, this week. So. Well, I came to see you. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, happen to be here. That's right. <laughs> so uh, we had you in. We wanted to talk, and, uh, you know, we, we love and appreciate you very much. Thank you. Uh, if you have questions for Ryan, 657-464-7609. Of course, you can email a voice memo from your smartphone to idoubtit at dollamore.com. We uh, would invite you to support the show via Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash idoubtitpodcast. Every little bit goes a long way if we're able to marshal the size of our audience if, if I mean, holy shit, if 10% of our audience became patrons, it would be uh, a big day, everybody. So $2 goes a long way, that, more than you would think. Anyway, uh, we love and appreciate you, your loyalty, the community that's built up around this show. And we will see you next time. For Brittany Page, Ryan Bell, I'm Jesse Dollimore, and this has been I Doubt.